Otis. Hey, welcome to the Cam and Otis show. On this episode, Lenny, I'll uh, see. Now, now I made fun of Camden and how he said her name, and now I can't say it. Lenny Cavazos. Cavazos. Yes, almost. I can tell I'm, I was at least close where she would raise her hand if we were in the classroom. Uh, Lenny, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today at the Time and Purpose podcast. I'm so excited uh, to get to spend some time with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited too. And, and you know, whenever I talk to somebody, and we both know our friend Catherine, uh, Catherine Cantos, and, and I, I probably, it wouldn't surprise me, I probably asked her the same question. He's like, all right, what do you, who do you think you are starting a business where people are going to really cool places and getting a lot out of it? I mean, how, how did that, how did you even come up with this idea? I mean, you were working in a big hotel chain when, when this came to you, right? Yeah, so I've been on the hospitality world for as long as I can remember. <laughs> I think I started working in hotels when I was 16 years old. Like wow. my summer works were in there. I had a little bit of a glitch at some point and I was just like, I'm going to study economics and you know international relations and I wanted to go into a completely different direction. And one year in, I was like, oh my gosh, this is not for me at all. I need to go back to hotels. So it's all about the service for me at the end of the day and this uh, community that you create with the people for guests of the hotel, but also who, people who work there. Like the work environment is so different uh, in the hospitality because it's a very fast paced environment. People don't get paid so well. Uh, and you have to be super extremely nice to everyone all the time. Uh, so you do learn a lot of like being patient and just like, smiling and you know being like okay this is good you know like you do have to have a very specific personality to be able to provide service for other people right it's not it's not for everyone because not everyone is prepared to really have this space where um you can be of service and really like take care of someone else sometimes even before yourself right mm. that's okay <laughs> you know it tends to go into that direction um not so many boundaries when you're in the hospitality world, I would say. Uh, so, yeah, I was just like, I was creating these uh, experiences. I wouldn't call them events. Like, and everything that I was creating was all experiential. And then when I was just like, okay, I need to do something that also connects with my spiritual life where there's not just an experience, but you're also transforming something, you know? You're coming out as a new person. That's when we keep planning all came to life. You know, it was just like, I was sitting in a coffee shop with a friend, honestly, and I was just like, oh, this is what I'm doing. And by then I already planned quite a few retreats because people were coming to me and they're like, hey, would you plan this for me? And I'm like, okay. You know, I was just like going with the flow. I was like, if this is what the universe is sending me, why not? Welcome. And then suddenly I was just like, okay, this is what I'm doing for a living, you know? And for me, it's so important to do it for my, for my clients, but at the same time, I also teach people how to do it for themselves or how to tell an assistant to help them run a retreat just because I know that my impact can be that I, I have a limited amount of weekends I can work right mm -hmm. so mm. I go through the, now the practice of like actually teaching people how they can do this for themselves or if they want to become retreat planners what all the things that they need to do you know it's so important like back in like 34 years ago there were not many hospitality schools now it's booming no one really teaches you how to be an event planner you learn on the go the same thing is going to happen with retreat planning no one is teaching you how to be a retreat planner on the ground and actually having the experience so it's all about starting creating this new style of hospitality school where you learn how to do things from a place of consciousness what was the uh, catalyst that got you wanting to move out of the hospitality towards this? You know, talking about going to study some econ and international affairs, even though that wasn't the direction you wanted to go. There's clearly a reason that you, you know, made that shift. And then that seems like it led to uh, the retreat planning. Is that right? Yeah. So the retreat planner definitely it still has a lot of my hospitality background and my bar marketing background and loyalty marketing. Like I bring into my business everything that I learned. I, basically the thing that happened is like the shape changed. 
And there was something, yes, that definitely created this change, but it was not really that I did not like my job or I didn't like my boss or I was just like, I'm done with this. It was something I think for me was external that just happened and I was just like, something, I basically I woke up one day and I'm like, okay, I don't want this job anymore. I'm done with being someone else's employee. And I was back then I was living in Dubai, so I, was, I had my corporate job that was amazing, it was great and then COVID hit. And I was doing activations for members. You know, I was doing all these crazy events like in the King's Summer Palace in Saudi Arabia and dinners in front of the, the Giza pyramids in Egypt. So like we were all like, like the events we were creating, there were so much fun. You know, I, have, I, I loved it. And then I was creating it from a space of like continuity. So people were like coming back and then I, we, we were creating relationships and connection between one person and the other you know I had a so were, were were these events uh on your own like more like were you more like a I, I guess event planner or was this part of when you were with um, Marriott right yeah so this was part of Marriott so I was part okay. of the team that launched Marriott Bomboy ah ooh <laughs> Which is huge. I mean, I, I've been a what, what Marriott Rewards guy for, I don't know, a long time, 15, 20 years. And yeah, that was a big deal when they did that. It was a big deal, right? Because we've had to change the back end, so the systems, but we also needed to change, we had to change the brand. When I joined the team, the first task that we had, we had a private concert with Craig David in Phoenix. And we just had to jump in and be like, okay, this is happening, global announcement. <laughs> All right, and it was so much fun. So I was creating the events, the ex experiences, mm -hmm. but I was definitely using agencies to help me execute. I'm not gonna say I was putting the tables in front of the Giza pyramid. I, <laughs> I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was creating the concept and I was making sure that the things were executed. And I was also doing the same thing, but for internal, for associates, for people, for employees, because we wanted to make sure that they knew that they could also now earn points, you know, that's something that before didn't happen in Marriott. So we had these activities, I had a competition for 11,000 people, it was a competition online and everyone was super engaged and it was so much fun. Then mm. when COVID hit, I was basically wrapped in cell in my 52nd floor apartment in Dubai, like, and I couldn't go out. I had to ask for permission every three days from the police to go out to the supermarket. The airports were closed. Like, I'm not saying I had a bad time because I I made a choice since the first day they sent me home, you know, that was kind of like hectic. It, it's, it, and now that I'm thinking about it, it felt like a zombie movie. Like suddenly everyone's like, <laughs> take your bags, take your computers, take your chargers. We don't know when we're coming back. <laughs> <laughs> It was really like a zombie movie. People were watching, showing these videos. People in Lebanon are dropping in the supermarket. <laughs> it was like a zombie movie. So when I went home, I was like, okay, I have a choice here. I either make the best of it or I binge watch everything on Netflix for the next couple of months until this is over. And I was like, I'm gonna make the best of, out of it. So I had actually a great time. I learned a lot. I spent some quality time with friends. But then when it was kind of like we were not locked down anymore, uh, I was just like, what am I doing here? I could be back in my ho hometown with a beautiful green garden, having my quarantine, not inside an apartment in the, de the middle of the desert. I was like, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I really have no idea. Like there was no idea of like, oh, the retreat planner is gonna be born or anything. But I just knew it was time for me to move on. That I've done what I was supposed to be uh, to be doing there, you know. Even my previous boss, her name is Catherine Miller. She's an amazing person, and I, I, am still in touch with her, and we have quarterly calls to catch up, you know. Like she's amazing. Like whenever I talk to her, she, one day she was like, I'm, I, "I'm not gonna offer you a job again. I know I could offer you a job again, but you're not gonna be happy here anymore." And She's always saying, oh, I have this feeling, one day you're going to be my boss. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, okay. You know, I'm like, this sounds good. And it really just fascinated with me. And I was like, Explain to us the difference between the, the event and the experiential retreat, if I got the term right. Yes, perfect. So an event 
it's a, it's a, a, a happening basically, right? That it's it has so it has certain pieces. So let's say you have a welcome, a drink, you have a dinner reception, then maybe you let's say you have an awards ceremony. So you have awards giving, and then you have dessert. There's a little bit of time to mingle, and then you go home. What happens? It's very transactional. You just go, you say ha ha ha, hello, you. Uh, so say hello to your peers, your friends. You sit down, you have a, a nice dinner, or maybe not even a, not such a nice dinner, and then you go home. When you go into an experience, and it can be the same in the same. Let, let me give you the example in the same format, mm -hmm. just so it makes like more sense. Of course, retreats are overnight, and they have more uh, things into it. But think about an experience where you're going into a dinner and someone took the time to actually figure out what kind of flowers best resonate with the crowd. So there's a smell. So you're mm. welcome by the smell of gardenias because we're going into this um, spring event, right? It's a spring welcoming dinner. So you have, you're already connecting with the message of the spring into what you're doing, right? You have your welcome dreams. They have as an essence that helps you open up your heart. So you'll be more willing to actually talk to these maybe random people that you have to go to this dinner with. Okay? Mm -hmm. You have someone explain to you why you are there. You know, you have a message that says like, thank you so much for joining us today. Today it's the moment where we're going to be creating innovation through creativity. We're going to find how our next and I'm talking this even into like a branding kind of experience, right? Mm -hmm. Tonight we're gonna see how our we're cre gonna create new senses for perfumes for a newest brand based on how we all feel and you know like because we always take care and value our employees. You have these let's say essences bar and you have someone who's helping you curate your own personalized perfume. And they keep they keep a sample with your name because this is a smell that they're gonna test later on to see if it becomes this, the new perfume of the brand. Mm. You move into dinner, and the place is beautiful, decorated in a way that has something, but it has also a name tag that says where you're supposed to be sitting down. You know, so you know that, and they curated who's sitting next to you. So let's say if i wanted to create connection between uh, across departments i would be like so i'm putting one someone from finance i'm gonna put someone from sales and marketing i'm gonna put someone from operations i'm gonna put someone from research and development and i'm gonna even create these cues and questions on the table so people ignite the conversation and there's an experience and new things are coming through right I'm getting goosebumps as, I, as I'm thinking of it. <laughs> like, I'm making a, it up as we go, okay? This is not something that has ever happened or I, I, I planned myself. This is something that I'm just like, you know, going into the experience myself. And I'm like literally seeing the table and the people there having conversations. So you have these like things that you make them, you know, like, and you can even have a mother day, moderator who's like sharing a story of why everyone that is there, it's key being there you know why are you supposed to be there mm -hmm. and then from there we go into dessert and then you have a place where people swap tables or you move them to a different location for dessert so they get to mingle with other people and then you have conversation breakers you know there's diff so many different ways that you can do it but you know just even having uh, some cards that explain like the food and like or let's say you have a chocolate bar you're like okay so because we're talking about perfumes and smells, you're so like, so ask the a card that says, ask the person next to you if they prefer white chocolate, milk chocolate, or dark chocolate. You know, just very simple touch points that take you through the experience. And then when you're leaving, there is someone out there just waiting there for you to say, hey, thank you for coming. Your feedback was so important. Even if you have a survey, here is the survey for uh, if you can please fill it in because we would really like to see what conversations sparked from here, you know, what new ideas came to. This is what a transformational experience looks like. 
What is your like creative energy or like your genius inside of it? Because as you're going through, you, you know, like you said, you're getting goosebumps. We can hear the excitement in your voice. But in a business, you know, it's rare that you're actually in there setting up the flowers and each little piece of it. So where do you find that creative flow? Okay. So, yeah, definitely I would not be uh, setting up the flowers. But for me, my creative flow comes in many different ways and forms. Um, for me, I just connect with what I want to transform, and then from there, basically, things start flowing, right? It's because I have trained my creativity to just come as I need it. But if you don't have it, um, there are different ways to spark creativity. You should be doing something outside of the normal thing. So if you, I'm like sitting behind my computer, I'm like, oh, I need to think about this con concept for this transformational event. What am I going to do? No ideas will come. So you go for a walk. You, so mm. some of the best ideas for so many people, including me, they're in the shower because you're outside of your rational mind. Like you're doing something automatic. So then your brain, your rational mind, your brain is just like, okay, so I, I'm going to scrub here. Okay. You know, you go into this process and then the creative is like, oh, I have, to, I have a space now to play. So new ideas come, right? So for me, is I create the concept, I curate what it needs to happen. So like exactly what I, like what I just told you, I would write it down as a brief and I'm like, okay, this is the flow of the event. This is what I want you to ha want to have. And then I touch point with like the different people and be like, okay, so you're a person who's a perfumist. So this is what I'm looking for the concept. Please tell me how this sounds. And then if there's anything else that you feel is valuable to add. Because my ideas might be what I can see right now, but then the other person also might have a creative idea and be like, yes, let's put a, 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 like a wax seal on their perfume. So it's personalized with their name. So they yeah. take a perfume and it has a brown on, already on it. Or Very uh, yes, the bottle that they should, they should be able to choose the bottle based on a personality type. There's a brand of uh, candles that makes a test and then they make you smell candles. They don't tell you which one it is. And it has like these organic essences. And then yeah. they say that the one that you really like the most is the one that your body is needing, right? And we did it as an activation. And then honestly, everyone who got the smell of the candle, everyone said, oh my gosh, yes, I do need more sleep. I have been struggling to sleep. You know, so they were resonating with the smell of what their body needed. So these kind of things are things that you might not even think that are possible. So I, I want to jump back to something you said earlier that I think uh, is, is hugely important. And I'd love to get your opinion of, or how you do it. Because uh, you mentioned when you were in the hotel industry and now you have to be nice to people all the time, right? You have to be... The, yes, sir. I understand that. Yes, ma'am. I understand. How can I, you know, all those sort of things. That's a great skill set to have. So how, when, when that person is like, you know, I wanted, I wanted, uh, you know, I don't know. I wanted two queen beds and you gave me a king and, uh, and you know, whatever it was, uh, how did you, how do you, how, and I'm sure you still do now. But what, what's the skill set that you do to, to handle that when somebody, the person that you're supposed to be serving is irate, if you will? Yeah. So um, I was very lucky to work in an international company that has a lot of standards and a lot of trainings. So I got a training. And of course, it has to do a lot with personal empathy and emotional intelligence as well, because other people that I know, they they took the same thing, they learned the same, they got the same trainings and they were still having a lot of issues, you know, like on how to deal with people. It is very um, high stress, high level because the expect it's all about perception and expectations, right? So I expect a king size bed and you gave me a, a, a two queens, right? As simple as that, there is nothing else. So, so for me, there is uh, this format that I really like that is called learn. So it's listen empathize, apologize, rectify, and notify. <laughs> so you listen first. So because we are always keen to being like very uh, responsive in life and be like, okay, oh, no, 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 sir. But 
your booking said it was two queens bed, two queen beds. Mm. Instead of hearing them out, why do they want a king bed? You know, is it because it's like a couple and they want to stay in the same bed? <laughs> it's a single person and doesn't like to feel that it's an empty room with an empty bed. You know, there's yeah. so many reasons behind why you chose a king bed rather than a queen size bed. There's other people who doesn't really care if they get a queen or a, a king, you know, like for me, I don't mind if like if they really don't have another. I will ask, you know, hey, so by any chance, do you have a king? But if they don't, I will, I'm not going to make a fuss of it because for me, mm. it doesn't make such a difference. But for some people, it does. It also depends on the culture where you're coming from, you know, like on the other side of the story, there's people who sleep in separate beds because of like snoring and all these kind of things. If you give them a king because you're like, oh, they're a couple, they can sleep in the same bed and they might have actual factual reasons of why they don't do it, right? So it's very important mm -hmm. to listen first and see where is this coming from and how you can, maybe you will be able to fix it in a different way. You know, maybe you can tell them, I don't have it today, but tomorrow I have one, you know? So this is more on the next step. And then you empathize. You say, okay, so I hear I hear where you're coming from. You know, I like I understand that this is a problem for you. You know, it's all about empathizing in a way of like really kind of like saying, I feel you, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I yeah. say, Which is okay. empathize. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Of course you have a better language to do this, right? Mm -hmm. And then you say, uh, we say apologize, but really apologize is it's on the same, like, okay, I'm sorry this happened because of the system. You don't have to justify why it happened, but I'm just sorry that this has happened to you. People just want sometimes to hear that someone cares for their feelings and their emotions are happening right there and now, not just like, oh, you know, you're the next person. No way. So, and then rectify. So you do something to fix it. And so many times, the way to fix it, it's not even like, it's like, okay, tomorrow I'm going to change it to a king bed. And then some other times it escalates and you need to comp nights and comp meals and do so many other things because then it becomes a very, very big issue. You know, there's issues are like more complicated than just it's the type of bed that you get in a room. But there is people who make will make a big mess out of it like the type, the bed type, you know, so you rectify it, you see what you can do to fix it uh, in the best possible way. Sometimes rectifying it means just saying, I know this happened. I'm sorry. Like, is it okay to, for you to have these two queen beds? Like, and sometimes that's enough, but sometimes you can be, okay, so tomorrow I will change you to a king size bed, or if you can, you upgrade them and whatnot. And then notify. Why is it important to not notify? If you have, and um, I can tell you a very quick story on one day that I really, <laughs> I'm going to say I really like messed up, but I managed to deal with things properly. So it was okay. <laughs> you can say you messed up. It's just us. Come on. <laughs> so, and then you notify. So other people know that this person is like already kind of upset and that mm. this has happened. So then no more things happen, right? So very <laughs> quick story to like, uh, like really see show how this works so one day i was working at a restaurant um and it's a beach restaurant right so i was a hostess there it was back in the like the, the beginning of my path and i was just working there and i loved it it was so much fun but sometimes we were so busy i had to serve tables i was not just welcoming them and sitting them so these couple they already had a bunch of issues with the room i don't know if they were on their honeymoon or you know but you know like it was a very chill beach restaurant and then uh, this beautiful woman you know uh, like very tall blonde hair russian comes with this beautiful beautiful dress and i was just like okay and then my boss was really behind me he was like no help me we're busy we're busy and i'm like oh this doesn't work for me you know i don't respond well to pressure <laughs> <laughs> for me it's more about like you tell me like hey do you mind no not at all and then i'm gonna do like T -t -t -t. but if i have someone behind my ear being like mm. uh, i actually don't work better so i was just like okay fine whatever i'm gonna serve them I think I, this was a regular guest that I've met before, and maybe this was a new girlfriend or something like that. I don't remember. <laughs> that part, those details I don't remember. But anyway, so I was there, and I was like, okay, so I'm going to serve them. 
And then I was just like, okay, so he asked for a beer and she got, asked for a glass of champagne. So I was like, okay, I'm going to serve the drink so my boss gets off my back. But honestly, I was very stressed because I had people coming to the door and I was supposed to be serving now drinks because we were super busy and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, doo, 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 with my tray, you know, walking. Oh, no. And then suddenly the beer glass falls and then oh, their no. whole dress got covered in beer. Oh. And I was so mortified. Because I was like, oh my gosh, if I'm on a date and this happens to me, I kill someone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was just so mortified by it. I was just like, oh my gosh, what's going on? What am I going to do? And I was so sorry. And I was just like, so first of all, I said, I am so sorry. Uh, let me fix as much as I can before, you know, like you give me a rant. And then I just, like, she didn't say anything. Actually, the guy was the one who was like, oh, my God, da, da, da. And she was like, no, I'm, okay. I'm going to go change. I have another dress. And then he went like, blah, blah, blah. and I was just like, I listen. You know, I, I went through the process. I said, I am so sorry this happened. And, you know, at the end, they were so nice to me. They were just like, oh, my gosh, this is something that can happen to anyone. Don't worry about it. I was more stressed about how they would feel about it you know of what happened then that they were actually were but i went through the process i was just not like uh, oh my gosh i'm gonna go hide in the back so no one sees me for the rest of the night and then uh, <laughs> let's hope they forget about it and you know who's gonna forget that someone spilled a beer on top of them so this is a one of the ways that you can really learn how to with the word learn how you can connect mm -hmm. with people in, certain, in the space of service and like have a, a toolbox basically to help you through this. I think uh, one of the interesting things for, you know, the hospitality business, you know, whether it's retreat or at a hotel is the like managing of expectations, you know, in the like psychology of it, the marginal loss hurts more than the marginal gain feels good. And I think that's the really interesting thing kind of you're talking about, like, was it their honeymoon? Because if it's their honeymoon, their expectations are so high. And it's all about if they have those high expectations, you have to accept them and you know kind of framing the retreats in that way and so what I'm curious about is do you do you work to not I almost want to say undersell the retreats so that it always comes in slightly higher where their expectations are being exceeded or what does that process look like because if they come in with expectations it's a 10 out of 10 then you've got to hit an 11 out of 10 every single time so do you do something to drop them down to that nine or or how does that work from your end <laughs> <laughs> then, then how do you exceed those expectations still <laughs> i just do i go the extra mile i just don't tell them exactly what i'm gonna do i don't disclose how i'm gonna do it the, mm. so, so like all this part that are like intentional when i like i plan retreats you know like these essences in the water to help you have lucid dreaming um like the type of food that is being served they hear that there is food that's going to be served they might know it's vegetarian they might know it's pescatarian i don't tell them the magic that happens behind so they know there's going to be transformation so they know the main transformation that they get right so let's say you're going to be going to a meditation retreat where you're going to learn vedic meditation so it's like a four-day thing right so you know that by the end of this retreat, you're going to learn the tips and techniques and the mantras for Vedic meditation. And these will help you transform your life in X, Y, Z, things that you need, you know, to really stress, to be more happy, whatever. So this is the main transformation that you sell, that you tell people that they're going to get. Everything else that is intentional behind retreat planning stays behind. Because these are, these are extra things that also they should not be knowing about. Like... There, like, for example, for me, if I do a menu that is heart opening and ha heart centered, so it has a lot of Arctic chokes and maybe has, uh, like, if it's a pescatarian, it has salmon, you know, it has certain things that aid your ha or heart opening, you know, asparagus and all this kind of food. I don't tell them. Because if you bring it into the mind, and this is not really because I cannot exceed their expectations or anything like this. If, I bring it into their mind instead of their heart and I tell the mind so you're gonna get food so your heart opens what's gonna do the mind gonna do it's gonna be thinking oh my gosh so my heart should be open by now how long does it take for the artichoke to how many 
Yeah. How many bites of salmon do I need to have before my heart opens up? (laughs) So this is why things are intentional, but it doesn't mean they need to know about them. Does this make sense? Like in a space of like how I don't like, it's not that I'm not telling them because I cannot exceed their expectations. It's I don't tell them certain things because it's on a, let's, let's say it's on on a need to know basis. Hmm. I love that. Um, and, you know, that actually sets up for another question I had, thinking more so again with your story of uh, last week I was getting my tire changed and I heard every single person complain to the guy at the discount tire about how they had to make it to work. And every single person went, God, I really got to get to work. I, I work at nine o'clock. We're here at eight. I, I got to get there. I got to get there. And I think that's the kind of funny thing. So, very different industry, but you talk about hospitality, it's everybody's honeymoon. It's everybody's anniversary. There's always this super high level of, uh, I don't know, it's just always a special event and people want to be treated in that special way like it's their special event, even though to you, it's normal. And I'm just, I guess, interested in the psychology of how do you approach that of making sure that they're still feeling special? You know, even a retreat, you get the same type of thing. Everyone's there for their, to learn how to meditate and to get that spiritual awakening. Everyone's there for that. So they kind of have this sense of importance about themselves that you then have to back up because kind of going back to the expectations, if you remove that, they're not, they're not special, then that kind of is going to hurt their experience a bit. So how, how do you make sure to manage that? Question. And I'm going to talk about like how the like this like the normal level that you should have, and then how you can also overdo it because I've seen this happen so much, and not that much in in the retreat. Like I've seen it in retreats, but a very very clear um, thing. It's in hotels because you see it like so much because people just tend to be really want to be like hundred percent or hundred and twenty percent. Uh, people pleasers and then it's not natural anymore right so it still needs to be feel very natural so number one thing that you can do is learn their names you know as basic as, as that just learn their names and have a and what I do is I always have like and my clients always have a conversation most of my clients they do very deep transformational work so they say for you to be able to come to my retreat you have to have a session with me before so you get to know them before they come so that you know what they're struggling with you know what they're coming to transformate in, in a retreat right i'm not saying like for me i don't really work with like uh, yoga retreats like oh you come you do yoga every day and you go home i work with things that are quite deeper you know like where a lot of emotions come through and you do need to know who's coming like because you want to serve them best right so even for my program mastering the art of retreat planning I spoke to every single person before they signed up. I was like, okay, so what are you looking for? What are you expecting from this? You know? So I already know what they're expecting. It's easy then. I can just actually deliver and then over deliver because I know exactly what they're looking for. A way to overdo it, for example, is if you're in a hotel and then you have, let's say this is a regular guest or someone, and then you have these things called uh, preferences, right? So people keep track of the, their guest preferences, the people who come a lot and things like that. And then it becomes like a competition. So everyone is like, who knows more about these guests? And then suddenly <laughs> one day this guest decided to have still water rather than sparkling. And someone decided that then this person is a still, per, uh, still water kind of person. But me, for example, I'm a sparkling water person. But if I'm with other people, I go for steel because most of the people that are my friends, they take, they drink steel. So they would have done with this with me and be like, I would come to the restaurant and be like, hi, Lainey, you know, because I have a booking, whatever, they know my name. Welcome to this restaurant. This is your table. We, uh, we found out that it's your birthday so we gave you this special table and then we know you like steel water so here's some steel water and i'm like well i'm a sparkling water kind of person right and then the <laughs> night goes on and then the person keeps coming up so miss laney so welcome do you need anything else are you okay and you know maybe i decided to have this dinner my birthday celebration dinner by myself because i'm traveling for my birthday and they're like and then they decide to like, because I'm alone, I need someone to talk to. So then they come and they're like, oh, so my name is this person and I'm from this country and my mom 
my, it's, her name is this, my brother, my sister. I have 20 cousins and nephews. And I came to this country because I really wanted to be able to support my family, you know, and then you kind of like, got, like I'm a, like, well, now to like transfer some money to her family. <laughs> <laughs> this is overdoing it. Trying yeah. too hard is overdoing it. When we try really, like, we tend to go into this place where we're, like, people-pleasing. You know, we're just doing it for the sake of pleasing the other, what we think is going to please the other person, right? Maybe I'm a super talkative person that day, and I'm excited to have a conversation with this person and learn their whole history. But maybe one day I'm not. But if you don't know these, uh, like, key markers, and honestly, it comes from body language, right? You, most of the times you can tell by body language and you're like okay so this is you know like this person i can approach this one no you, you like you can really tell but so many people become oblivious of this because they become like a machine so if you do the same in retreats and you're like so everyone needs to have a super special treatment because they're so so special because they feel so so special and so i need to make sure that everyone is okay and that all their dietary requirements are good you spend your time and you focus your energy instead of teaching your course and doing actually the actual transformation maybe talking to the kitchen staff and telling them so make sure there is an option without onion for this person because they didn't say they didn't like it but when i saw them eating on the salad i saw they removed the the raw onion from it so now can we have a special <laughs> i mean that's great attention to detail i i gotta hand 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 you that but yeah i could see how you could you could drift off and you know it's that old adage if, if everybody's special then nobody's special right but you can ask beforehand and be like, hey, do you have any yeah. dietary restrictions? Or if you see them like really pulling something apart, just being like, hey, if you don't like raw onion, let me know and I can speak to the kitchen. They might be able to do something for you. But not just assuming that because they didn't want onion that day, then they never eat onion. Right. Because maybe they didn't want onion breath for later on that night. I exactly. don't know. Maybe but they had a so date maybe, afterwards. It's just easier to make a question. To, you know, to ask so where's the best place to have a retreat? Because you see all these beautiful pictures. Matter of fact, I, I think it's on your website or your profile. I saw this one. You're like sitting in the sand. It's this beautiful, serene place. It's probably really hot. Uh, no, but no. <laughs> but where, where's the best place to have a retreat? So actually, I'm going to answer this question from uh, a different, it's going to be a different answer. So uh, it's not going to, probably not what you're expecting as an answer, but I'm going to answer it this way because this is, I, I feel this is something that makes a difference. So the best place to have a retreat, first of all, probably at the, if you're at the beginning, it's going to be close to home, not mm -hmm. so far away. So because you don't want to go through the whole like traveling and not knowing what's around, right? So this is. It's if you're the one hosting a retreat, right? If you want to go to a retreat, it's more about the teacher than the location. The location, of course, it's nice because it's also traveling. Are you going to a place? But if you choose, for example, let's say I was in this beautiful place and that was not the case, but um, I was going for, uh, there was a retreat. And then because I wanted to go to that place, I go to this retreat that is a silent retreat. And I don't really want to go to a silent retreat and just I choose it for the location, then I'm doing a disservice to myself because I'm choosing the thing instead of the transformation for the location. Now, if you are someone planning a retreat, something that I really bring into mind is to consider the elements. And I know it sounds a little bit weird, but to consider the elements as a, a really key driver on how you choose a place. So emotions water uh for fluidity you know so like for example if you want to work with a lot of emotions and you want people to clean clear them out maybe something close to a lake something close to a river if you're working with chaos and you want something like really really you know that shakes them up a place that is very windy wind, windy windy yeah wind creates chaos if you want to deep transformational work where they're doing really going deep down into their feelings, something that has a lot of earth, 
So something close to a mountain, for example, you know, something that really feels like it's grounded, that is very stable, somewhere where there is like big trees that have deep roots, you know, mm -hmm. like they say a tree has the same uh, length of roots than it has on the top. So it's very, very grounded. So this is a very beautiful place for it to go. And then fiery places, desert, uh, desert spots, you know, where the sun is very, very intense. This is what we consider as a location with the element of fire. So uh, if you wanted to do something uh, really transformational and like to like bring out a lot of like either rage or uh, a lot of uh, rest, you go to a place that is very hot. So maybe a desert because these are the two when you have a lot of extra amount of like sun you either go into rage mode or you go into rest mode so if you wanted to like really take them deep into like finding which one is the one they go to like this would be very like confrontational emotions not my type of retreat if i'm being very honest because i'm into like this surrender and enjoy you know kind of uh, retreats that's more like you do deep transformation but you all, don't always have to do it through these like <laughs> not, you know like, it's not a boot camp you know but if you wanted to do something uh in that space then a place with a lot of sun is a place that you choose mm. so the elements will help you through the process of the transformation that you want to create on the uh, on the retreats i know it's not what everyone answers, I don't, I haven't heard anyone else uh, said this, but this is what I've seen through experience, like personal experience when I'm also going through transformation. I can see the difference on how I react. You know, it's like for me, I, if I'm on a beach location where it's super windy, I cannot work. I'm in the computer, I'm like, what am I doing in the computer? I'm supposed to be in the water. And it's also super windy, so my brain cannot focus. So I cannot really, like, and then if I'm in the, somewhere next to the mountain, I'm like, huh. I sit down and I'm like, huh, oh, done. You know, super simple. Things are, uh, they have more longevity when you're, like, for example, if you're working things where you're in a, like, in a mountain, fast-paced city. Hmm. Right? So it makes sense why I'm just so full of rage and resting down here in the desert in Tucson. So that that's eye opening for me. You're either you're just this way or that way, aren't you? <laughs> I'm just bouncing back and forth, and it's the heat, so that you know that's eye opening. Um, but you know, it's, talking about those elements, it got me thinking. We we've talked about the planning process, and so much of the planning and the expectations, you know, frames the way that the guest has their experience. And one of the things I'm really curious about is what I call the water cooler factor. So I had a virtual events company, and when we were trying to uh, figure out how to do networking events during COVID, and one of the things we were talking about is just that random occurrence, the chance of the networking events is where is why people are there. We called it the water cooler effect in our team meetings. And those unplanned experiences are what people get the most out of. Uh, you know, thinking back to uh, my honeymoon, actually, we went and did a dinner uh surf and turf by the ocean and did all that but we were the only ones that booked that time so we wound up getting the beach to ourselves there was you know there were three other tables they took them away it was just as we got dance on the beach there was a guy with a violin it, it was all amazing but that was completely unplanned that was all extra on what we had already there um how do you factor in those unplanned experiences and try to not necessarily plan them but leave room for the unplanned to take place can answer to that and yeah sometimes these wow factors you know the surprise factors are amazing and that's what really actually creates sometimes most of the transformation so when it comes to retreats so uh, so many times this is really the thing that triggers uh, the change so for example like you could go and have very very deep transformation and then that you know like you, you're like and maybe it hasn't synced in and you're just going through this process of like releasing let's say family trauma right and then suddenly you have free time and it's like pool time you have the pool right there and then you go into the water and then it hits you you're like oh my gosh i just released all this you know i'm not so angry anymore what happened this time i call it integration time Right. So for me, when you're planning a retreat, you have to have a balance of transformational time and integration time. So this balance is very important. 
Integration time can include a few activities. It can be a sound healing, it can be a massage, but you have to leave space for things to happen. There was a, uh, a retreat that was about lucid dreaming and meditation. So they had actually mm. time scheduled for naps during the day. So they had naps scheduled. It worked out because they had this time for them to go and practice their teachings, but it did, it wasn't like practice your teaching with everyone around. It was like, okay, so now it's nap time. If you don't want to sleep, don't go. But you know, but you have this time for yourself to practice the learnings. So integration time is so important because this is where all these unexpected surprises happen. You can have a conversation with someone, you know, or suddenly um, I'm the type of person who's like, okay, so we have this time and we're just like, you know, like people go and then, you know, you're in the garden, you're doing whatever you're doing. And then suddenly it's like, huh, I'm going to share some, some chocolate, as simple as that. And I bring out the bar of chocolate because I always have like some chocolate with me in this, in retreats. Because <laughs> are, are you are you like a uh, closet grandma? You always have chocolate with you. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't need actually more uh, that much chocolate. I'm more of like sadly I'm more of a chips person. But um, <laughs> like, cacao has this beautiful effect on our nervous system. It balances it out. Mm -hmm. So my brother says. If you're happy, drink cacao. If you're sad, drink cacao. <laughs> <laughs> it does have the teobromine that really like balances your nervous system. Mm -hmm. So people think, oh, if I drink cacao, I'm not going to be able to sleep. But the other, it's actually the other way around because it just brings you back into balance. So when you're going through transformation, your nervous system goes out of balance because it's not, it doesn't know what's going on. It's like, oh my God, what are you doing to me right now, right? And sometimes just bringing out some cacao and just like sharing it with people or making a smoothie and being like, hey, who wants some? Um, is this space, basically what you're creating is a space for connection. That's awesome, man. Well, uh, I'm going to make me a cacao drink when we, uh, when we get done here in just a second so I can, so I can continue to be happy. This is, uh, this has been awesome. And I tell you what, uh, I, I relearned or reemphasized something that uh, is such a fundamental, basic thing, and that's just knowing the person's name. It's it's so foundational, and it gets so wiped away that it makes a huge difference. You know, it's it's that greeting, "Hi, Lenny. Hi, Miss Cavazos." Did I say it? I said it wrong again, probably. Uh, I told you I'd mess that up as soon as, as soon as I make fun of Cam. I do this every time, but you know, it's it's. But that's that simplicity that makes it personal, because now now I know there's a connection between myself and the luggage guy, the the, the porter, the doorman, the the hostess, whatever. They know me, and that means that they actually treat me like a person instead of a number, and that's a huge thing in any business. So that that was a great reemphasis for me to relearn that. How about you, Camden? What'd you learn? Uh, I'm curious as to what a porter actually is, because I thought that was somebody who worked on a train. I don't know if they have those anymore. I'm just picturing the Johnny Cash song, Hey Porter, but I don't know if that's actually true or not. <laughs> um, but no, what I learned uh, was, and I already said this one, but it's with talking about those elements, and a lot of them were really intuitive, and it was interesting to hear the elements of the desert, you know, since I lived here, and how, uh, what the, how the heat can affect you with that rage or rest, which really, the more I think about it, the more it makes sense. You know, when it's summer here, things slow down we're just like all the animals we stop moving everyone just sleeps all day so that that's a awesome thing and yeah weirdly eye-opening considering how i've lived here for going on eight years now <laughs> lady how about you what did you learn i'm glad i could be a service and now that you can see it you can be like okay maybe i'm spending the summer somewhere else if i want to <laughs> Or, you know, sometimes just being yeah. aware of it, it just makes such a difference because you also become more compassionate, right? About, mm -hmm. uh, about what you're doing. And sorry, I haven't said what I learned. I will go, go to that. But you become more compassionate and you're like, it's okay to have a nap. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, I think it's, uh, it's very important for all of us to be more compassionate about our needs. Of course, mm -hmm. you don't become someone who's like taking a five hour nap every afternoon because it's super hot. 
but it's just more about like okay so i understand what's going on and what my body needs right and and then we bring this information into our everyday life right mm -hmm. so, now for me i think uh, something i learned that i found very interesting is this the like this term of like the water cooler effect because and for me also so, like and this co is connected to the point of like uh really kind of bringing this very concept of like the unexpected like the unplanned kind of like not really the unexpected but more like the unplanned part of uh mm. when you're doing things i do it do it so intuitively now that it's like for you know for me it's just like part of the flow like when i was taking you through this experience i was just like i was there <laughs> you know I, i went to the events like i already experienced it it was like it was amazing by the way And um, and I hope some people who are listening to us will get to like close their eyes and be like, oh my gosh, yes, I can smell <laughs> genius, right? But yeah. it's all about this unplanned uh, space and really like bringing it to notice, you know, like bringing it under the light and mean like this is important and keep spending time, leaving time for this. It's uh, it matters a lot. It just makes a difference. Oh. That's awesome. How how do folks uh, find you? What's what's a good way to get in contact with you, follow you? Uh, so you can find me at theretreatplanner.com. So that's my website. And then on Instagram, I'm called The Retreat Planner as well. And I share a lot of information and like I give a lot of free workshops. And I'm always sharing educational pieces with people because for me, the most important thing is that people get to learn uh, how to do retreats in a, in a space that is really transformational. So I know I have two pairs of hands and 52 weekends per year. And this is meant to go further down the line, right? So... I hope everyone who's interested in retreat planning comes and checks me out. And hopefully I can provide some useful information for them. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This has been great. And yeah, uh, does make me want to want to at least at least make my cup of co cacao here here a little bit in a little bit. Tell your brother. Thank you. There's another thing I learned. So, yeah. <laughs> I will awesome. definitely tell him. Cacao is amazing. I love it. Yeah. I, I, I thought you were going to say, Dad, you got to come down here to the desert so you can get angry. Yeah. <laughs> no, I don't need heat to get angry. <laughs> <laughs> Camden, run us out. All right. Thank you all for listening to the Cam and Otis Show. And a special thanks to our guest, Lenny Cavazos, for joining us today. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to pass it along to someone else so they can enjoy it too. Uh, follow the Cam and Otis Show on Facebook and Instagram. Full videos of our show are available on YouTube. And the full archive of our episodes is available at www.caminotisshow.com. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.